End of the day, we are our own people. Every one of us, we're individuals. We have to follow the right path in life. And if somebody's misleading you or not telling you the right things to do, misleading you, you got to break away. You got to politely or affirmatively say, no, it's not for me. Hey everyone, welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody is doing well. All is very good. Very blessed on this end. As always, I give God all the praise, honor, glory, and thanksgiving for that. And before I get started today, I want to thank everyone that watched my last two videos. Uh, one of them was titled, I Had Enough, and the other one I think was Hypocrites or Hypocrisy, something to that effect. Second one was about, you know, some matters involving Andrew Tate and how I believe there was so much hypocrisy in people that were condemning him and yet allowing so many things that are going wrong in this country and not saying a word, basically using Andrew Tate as a scapegoat. The comments were excellent, I would say. Many people agreed with me. Some people didn't, which is fine. We don't mind uh, respectful disagreements. When people get silly and start name calling and are so informed, uninformed about things they say, well, we just move on. We don't really pay attention to that. But respectful disagreements, hey, you're entitled to your opinion. Sometimes we answer when my team can get to them, when I can get to them. But if not, you know, we have so many that we, uh, uh, we just have to pass over them. But I want to thank you for the comments. I had enough. I finally got into issues that were really bothering me, things that I felt were terribly wrong in this country. And people, it's not politics. It's about issues that we are dealing with that are impacting our lives, that are so critical, so crucial, not only to us, but to our kids, our grandchildren, to so many children and people in this country that I had to speak out about it. And I appreciate the response I got. You know, it was overwhelming. Uh, people said, Michael, finally, you're speaking out. We wanted to hear what you had to say about these issues. Because look, I know how this channel grew. I know my background. I told a lot of mob stories. I told a lot of things based upon my experience. And you reacted well and you gave me, hey, well over a million subs and it keeps climbing. So thank you for that. But I think we're in a time where from my perspective, from my being on the street for so many years, from my having a father that was uh, a heavyweight in that life, uh, for spending time in prison, for doing all the things that I've done, to give you my perspective about issues that are happening today, I think I see it from a, a unique perspective. And so thank you so much, all of you, really, for the great comments that I got and, uh, and for valuing what I had to say. I appreciate that very much. So I'm going to continue, and I want to entertain you. Right now, my team and myself, we're looking at some other movies. I'm going to be sitting down with Nick Turturro, who played uh, Sammy Gravano in a television show, a television series, I believe, or a miniseries, not too long ago. Nick will be sitting down with me shortly. We're going to do a sit-down, an interview with him, and I think it's going to be very, very interesting. His brother is John Totoro, so, you know, they're a good acting uh, uh, brothers, and uh, I think you're going to enjoy it very much. We have a lot of other things lined up, so I'm not going to get away from that, and we will be doing some Mob Movie Mondays again. Uh, and I have a mob story today, a mob-related story that I can really relate to that I want to talk to you about. Now, you know, last time when I was starting that video, I had enough. I had to have a glass of wine to start with. And I'm going to do that again today because people, I'll tell you, I look at wine differently. You know, when I was younger and I went out to the bars and I was doing all the club thing and I was in a club just about every night back in that life, I never drank. I didn't drink anything. I had a white wine spritzer every once in a while, really just to hold a glass in my hand and to drink and, uh, and conform with some of the people that were doing that. Because, hey, have a drink with me. Okay, give me a white wine spritzer. It was very light. I didn't have a taste for alcohol, and I really still don't. Every once in a while, I'll have a beer. When Blue Moon came out, I said, hey, you know what? This isn't bad. Before that, really didn't like beer that much. But I'll drink one every once in a while. But that's it. I don't go for really any hard liquor, uh, but I love wine. And why do I love wine? My grandfather, 
you know, who came here in the early 1900s, came over from Naples, Italy. He, was, uh, he had a bakery in Greenpoint, and he used to make his own wine in the basement. And uh, my father was one of 19 kids, so you can imagine how many cousins I have. Every one of his brothers and sisters had seven, eight, nine, ten kids. So we have a clan, a family, forget it. But my grandfather, at the age of eight, nine, and ten, he was giving us wine to drink. So it wasn't like a real alcoholic beverage for us at the time. We didn't view it that way. We viewed it as a kind of a family-style uh, drink. And when I was in that life, we drank a lot when we had, you know, our pasta and our our, uh, our feasts that we used to have all the time. So when I drink a glass of wine, it kind of makes me calm in a way, you know. As a matter of fact, if I have two or three, I'm ready to go to sleep. You know, that's the effect it has on me. So, you know, with all the stuff that's going on in this country and in this world, I take a glass of wine because sometimes I want to shout at the television. I just get so crazy. My wife says, calm down, have a glass of wine. So that's what I'm doing. So before most of these shows now, because I'm so irritated about so many things, I'm going to have a glass of wine so that I project myself properly with all the people that I've, I've come to really love and care about. You're all great. And man, I really do appreciate the comments when I get a chance to look at them. I really do. And one of the reasons we look at them, we can't answer all of them. Please don't be offended. When I answer one and I don't answer another, people say, oh, Michael, how come you only answered that guy? So we have to be fair, and we get thousands, thousands of comments. But I do appreciate it because we get some ideas, we get some questions that you want answered, the whole bit. So, But I'm so irritated with so many things that are going on. I take a sip of wine, that's all, just a sip. Eat one glass tonight, that's it. And now I'm ready to go. My dog comes over here to keep me company. She's gone, Nova, I love her very much. Uh, and now I'm ready to talk. This story, oh, before I go, again, it's coming up in two weeks, June 24th at the Lorraine Palace Theater. I'm going to be there. I did a big radio interview today with a couple of guys from Cleveland. Great guys, answer, asked me some great questions, different than what I've had in the past. So I'm looking forward to that. There are still tickets available, I found out. I thought it was close to sold out, and it is, but there are some tickets available. It's a big theater, so they opened up another section from what I'm told. Uh, I'm going to spend a little time in a little Italy in Cleveland. Look very forward to coming there because the people have been wonderful. And uh, as of right now, we're still scheduled July 22nd in Miami with Mike Tyson and Chaz Palminteri. It's going to be a great night. It's going to be um, Champions Corner presents Remade Men. And I consider Mike and myself pretty well remade from our past and, and, uh, and especially because of what we're doing now. So those two dates, put them on your calendar, remember them. If you can get there, that's terrific. So what's today? There's an article that I read that I can totally relate to, and you'll understand why. And I want to read it to you, and I'm going to give you my perspective, my experience as we go along. And this is for a lot of young men out there. You know, um, sometimes our fathers uh, could be a great influence on us. In my case, he was a great influence. My dad uh, taught me a lot of good things. Of course, the negative side people can view is that uh, he did propose me and lead me into the mob life. But he didn't want that for me originally. Want me to go to school, be a doctor. Circumstances changed in our life. I got into that mob life to help my dad. Eventually did get him out of prison. You know the story, he kept going back. But uh, he was a good influence on me. I'd have to say that in, in many ways. And we had our differences later on. But there are, there are fathers sometimes that don't lead their children, their sons especially, in the right direction. White boy Rick. I don't think his dad was a great influence on him. He was involved in drugs. He allowed his son to be an informant for the FBI. And look at how it turned out for him. Terrible. Went to jail for 30 or 33 years when he was 16 or 17 years old. You know the story. I did a video on it. You can watch it. There have been uh, biographies and movies made about his life. So his dad was not a good influence on him. And I want to tell the young people, you know, you got to have a mentor in life. Hopefully you do have a dad and he is responsible. And he does teach you the right way because it's vital in our young people's lives. So many of the young people I met in prison didn't have a father. As a result, they ended up in prison, bad lifestyle, and uh, you wouldn't want to be in their shoes. Trust me. It was very, very, very sad. But if you have a dad that's not a great influence on you, you have to be able to stand up at some point and say, no, dad, this is not what I want to do. You got to be able to do that because, look, end of the day, we are our own people. Every one of us, we're individuals. We have to follow the right path in life. And if somebody's misleading you 
or not telling you the right things to do, misleading you, you got to break away. You got to politely or affirmatively say, no, it's not for me. This story is about a young man. The title of it is uh, the son of a mafia boss who rebelled against his destiny. Now, you know why I can relate to that people, right? My dad was the underboss of the Colombo family. Eventually, I rebelled against that destiny, but for a long time, I was part of it. So let me read you that article, and I'll stop along the way, give you some of my own experiences, hope you enjoy it. But all you young people, please listen in, because this is for everyone. It's not just a mob son. It could be anybody, any walk of life. If you're being led in the wrong direction by a father figure, a mother, somebody close to you, family, relative, friend, you got to be able to stand up and say, no, I'm not going to do that. So here's the article. Antonio Piccarillo, scion of a capo in Italy's Camorra criminal organization, is encouraging other young people in his situation to stay away from a life of crime. I've been doing that for the last 20 years. Now, the Camorra in Italy is considered by the Italian government to be the most violent, the most murderous group of all mafia groups in all of Italy. And um, unfortunately, I think it might be. And one of the strongholds is in Naples, Italy. That's where my dad came from, my grandfather. I'm Nabiladan. Even my mother's family comes from uh, Naples. So I'm like 100% Nabiladan, Neapolitan. A few years ago, in the center of Naples, a stray bullet in a shootout between rival clans hit a four-year-old girl. She had been sitting with her grandmother on a terrace. This is, the, this is the most horrible side of anything having to do with gangs and shootouts and mafia. What's going on in Chicago, people, it's horrible. Innocent people being killed, walking across the street, babies in carriages being shot at. Of course, it's not intentional. But this is the overflow. This is what happens, okay, when gun violence starts to happen and gangs start to go after each other. It's a horrible thing, horrible. And this is a tragedy. And it really caught the attention of this young man. The story of Noemi, the girl who ended up in a coma due to lung injuries caused by the ammunition, circled around the world. Everybody heard about this. I don't recall it, but I'm sure if they're saying that, it did. Antonio Piccarillo saw the news. He didn't know how to channel all the discomfort he felt. He didn't know how to process that. How can you process that? An innocent girl being shot, a stray bullet, which he had been accumulating over a lifetime of omerta, as the code of silence in Italy is known. You know what omerta is. That's the oath that we all took. But the next day, May 5th, 2019, he decided to attend a public demonstration against the Camorra criminal organization, along with three of his friends. He had no plan. He simply wanted to be in solidarity with the people protesting because it bothered him so much to see this young girl shot like that. At one point during the rally, he heard a speaker say that all the sons of gangsters were the same. And that offended him because you know what? At that point, it probably was true. And it bothered him and it got to him. You know, people, you got to have a conscience in life. You know, people ask me all the time, Michael, how did you do some of the things you did? And look, I take responsibility for that. But there were times when I was very uncomfortable with things that I had to do. It was kind of like I stepped outside of myself. I did what I had to do and then I came back to myself. It's not an excuse. I, I take full responsibility, but I'm telling you how I dealt with it. Because sometimes some of the things you do, that you just can't process them properly, but you're under an order, you gotta do it, you do it, but it's not really what you wanna do. It's not who you really are. Let me continue. My name is Antonio Piccarillo. I'm the son of Rosario Piccarillo, who in his life made many mistakes and was a member of Italy's Camorra Mafia. Always love your parents. This is a quote. But disassociate yourself from their lifestyle because it leads nowhere and only causes suffering. The bad life has always been terrible today and 150 years ago. And people, I relate to that. I call the mafia, the gang life, evil lifestyles for exactly the reason that he's talking about. Tragedies like this happen. Every family of every member of that life that I know have been devastated, including my own, again, not my wife and kids, but you know the story with my family. Mother, brother, sisters, devastating. Dad doing 40 years in prison. And it happens to all the guys. Nobody, nobody really misses that fate. They can't avoid it. It's part of the life. Let me read on. The people froze. 
Piccarillo, the capo of the clan that ruled the Toretta neighborhood in Naples for decades, was a legend in the world of organized crime, as was Sonny Francis. He was a legend. And when I walked away from that life, it was like, oh my God, what's going to happen? Is he going to cooperate? Is he going to enter the witness protection program? Is he going to put people away? Is his father going to put a contract on his life? Is he going to be disowned? I went through all of that because my father was that kind of a figure. And quite honestly, I made a name for myself also. And it was stunning when I walked away and renounced the life. His family had made its living in the 1960s by smuggling cigarettes. They always lived that way without major conflicts. That is, until Rafael Cutolo, not, uh, I don't believe it's related to the Cutolo here that was part of the Colombo family, the historical leader of the Camaro created Nuova Camorra Organizeta, New Organized Camorra, at the end of the 1970s. This system imposed a methodical and hierarchical structure over the territory, with the idea being they were going to compete with the powerful Cosa Nostra in Sicily. Now, in America, it's called Cosa Nostra because the Sicilians were the dominant group here. So when you became a member of the Mafia Cosa Nostra here, it was Cosa Nostra because the Sicilians really formed it here in America. Cotola wanted a piece of everything. He counted each carton of tobacco that moved in Naples. It was a mistake as smugglers are thick-skinned people. Piccarello and many others simply couldn't accept this. They associated with families of the Secundigliano the northeastern neighborhood, and fully entered the Camorra to start a war without mercy. Always warring, like the Colombo family. Three wars in my lifetime. Antonio's father, nicknamed Obiando, the blonde, like Nicky the blonde in our, in our life, is in prison today. He's the son of that long history of organized crime. He took over from a generation of mafioso who are now nearly extinct. That's true. Elegant, handsome, always well-dressed and discreet. Look at some photos of my dad. Always dressed sharp, looked the part. You know, he, he was just a stereotypical mob guy at that point. The prototype of the old school mobster like Sonny Francis. He was in and out of prison for years, just like my father, never betraying anyone. My dad would die with his boots on. It was more important to him than anything else to maintain that legend in life. Unfortunately, and I will say this, and I love my dad, it was more important than his family. And his family suffered tremendously as a result of that. Really did. So you can call him a great guy, and I do. I love my dad. But then you look at the price his family paid, the price that he paid. Terrible. He never betrayed anyone, always maintaining his image. Yes, image. So important to my father, apparently so important to this gentleman. The last thing one expects in this type of family where silence is the law is for a child to publicly denounce this lifestyle with a megaphone in hand. Well, I didn't do it with a megaphone, but I did it all over the media. I wrote books about it, I talked about it, documentaries about it. I did a bunch of things, so it was like holding a megaphone, maybe worse, who knows. But he was in the square in front of all of these people. It's unheard of, but he did it, he stood up. Antonio is now 27 years old. He was in 2019. He has blonde hair like his father. A lot of Italians are blondes. You probably don't know that. A lot of Mexicans are blonde too. How do I know that? I married a Mexican. She's not blonde, but she told me that. Her family. A lot of people are blonde in Mexico and in Italy. He speaks with El País at noon on a Tuesday, seated at a table in a small tavern in the Santa Lucia market. El País, I guess, is a publication, this publication. Antonio grew up in a Camorra family, and that, he says, implies having very few memories. My father spent many years in and out of prison, like mine. We would see each other for brief periods, of course. I hardly have any photos with him. I have a couple, not many. It was a childhood, let's say, of absences, absolutely. But everything seemed normal. We were not the typical rowdy family at home. We pretended to be normal. My dad would never bring what was going on in the outside world into the house. He didn't want to talk about it. They told us lies all day to hide what was happening. Of course, the lying mothers, as I call them, lies in good faith, of course, so as not to make us suffer. They told me that my father was an architect, a lawyer, and you would later tell these lies to your friends, to acquaintances. My dad told me he owned a tailor shop, and he did, but I knew he wasn't a tailor a dry cleaning place. He wasn't in the dry cleaning business. Well, he was as a partner, but he didn't do anything there. He also told me he was in the music business. And yes, he had a piece of a couple of music uh, companies, record labels. 
uh, Buddha records. He had a, an interest in spring records at the time. You know, things like that. So that's what he told me his occupation was. He also uh, went partners with a guy in an auto body shop that I worked at as a kid. So this is what my dad told me. He never said, hey, I'm a member of organized crime. I'm the underboss of the Colombo family. He never said that. Of course, I knew it from publications, from others, from other things that I read. The story was similar to the one heard by so many other children of imprisoned bosses, myself being one of them. The father is a builder. The jail where you have to go from time to time to chat in a small room sitting on iron chairs was one of the buildings where he was working. I used to tell my, my kids the same thing. It was about funny. I was in L.A. County Jail locked up once, and uh, I was telling my kids they came to visit me. We didn't even realize it. And I told them, well, I'm away at work. I have to work in this building. And uh, my oldest daughter said, Dad, why does it say L.A. County Jail on your uh, uh, on your shirt that I had on, you know, the prison khakis. I said, well, I'm caught. I don't even remember what I said to get out of that. But yeah, we made up those things. It went on like this for quite some time until one day someone opened his eyes. That happened to me too, people. His best friend, the daughter of a family at odds with his family's control of the area, brought Antonio a newspaper. On the cover appeared his father and the words, usury, extortion, and jail. You know how I first found out about my dad? We had a, uh, a housekeeper, a maid, that was from England. Uh, Paulina, uh, Paula her name was, I'm sorry. And uh, when I was very young, she told me about my dad, what he really was. That was the first time I was probably you know, seven, eight, nine years old, something like that. And she told me about my dad. And that's when I first learned that, okay, that's why there's police around. That's why there's all this stuff going on from our English maid, believe it or not. That's what your father does, she told him. At first it was hard. He cried, didn't understand anything, but he soon connected the dots. I didn't cry. I was just like, wow, I didn't even know what to say. There were always people going in and out of the house. My dad always had people coming in and out. They hid when the police rang the doorbell because my father was under house arrest and couldn't receive visitors, he recalls. Little by little, he got used to this reality. He even began to like it. Now, you know, you know, people in school, you know, kids in school. I had some fights with them, but some people thought it was cool. Hey, your dad's a mobster. You know, my dad had a lot of publicity. And some people related to it. I had some fights because of it. You got a mafia dad, your dad's a murderer, and this and that. So it goes both ways. Old school mobsters like my father caused a certain fascination, no doubt. They were sinister, but very magnetic, as was my dad. Always well-dressed, very polite. They know how to talk. They know how to walk. They were very attentive, and I grew up with that idea of my father. Besides, I never had a clear idea of why some people treated me so well here. I'm very polite and respectful, but it always seemed like I deserved more than my friends. I saw that. If I hit a window or a market stall with a ball, Fiona didn't scold me, but he would scold my friends. And that impressed them. Walking around the neighborhood with the son of a boss had its privileges. I played baseball. My dad would always come and visit me. He never missed a game, no matter what he was doing. He'd drive up in a big Lincoln, a big Cadillac. That's the car he drove. He'd never go into the parking lot because he was late. He'd pull right up to the field. I'd be up to bat. He'd get out of the car with a bunch of his guys, never traveled alone. He walks onto the field. He walks into the stands. I'm up at bat. The umpire took one look at that crew, never called strike three on me when he saw, when he saw that crew. I used to tell dad, hey, you're very good for my batting average. You know, when I played football, nobody would tackle me when he was in the stand. So when you play sports, it's good to have a, a, a dad and a mom. That idea of blood privilege dominates the epic of the mafia story. TV series like Gamora have marked the mystique of the mafia in Italy and the family bonds that tie them together. That's not to mention the cars, the expensive clothes, the tattoos, secret networks. This goes for Naples, but also in Sicily or Calabria, where blood ties are even stronger than Camorra. Almost everyone likes this lifestyle at first. Isn't it attractive? So many young kids. Michael, you had the cars, you had the women, you had all the money, you had a jet plane, you dressed well, everybody respected you. They see it in the movies, but I say, yeah. You watch Goodfellas, right? Yeah. Did you see the end of the movie? Who went to jail? Who got killed? Whose family got destroyed? They don't see that. Oh, that's not going to happen to me. They only see the big, the romantic stuff. You know, they don't get it. Almost everyone likes the lifestyle at first, but Antonio's decision has shown a different way forward for others. Like Giosk, the eldest son of one of the Drangata Mafia clans in the Calabrian municipality of Rosano, 
He also disowned his family after initial complicity. A few years ago, a judge began to implement a controversial measure to keep the children of gangsters away from their parents. Roberto De Bella, president of the Reggio Calabria Juvenile Court, designed the Free to Choose Project. He began to take away custody of children from a large number of families from the Drangada. It was a harsh and highly controversial measure which produced results in even a movie. I don't like that. I don't think you should take kids away from their parents. I'm sorry. I'd have to look a little into this uh, a little bit further, but I'm not too, uh, I, I don't like that. I'm sorry, I don't like that. Antonio didn't need anyone to separate him from his family. He just got fed up with it all. He turned to the theater, to music, the sea, literature. But the day he raised his voice in the square, silence fell all around him. In the neighborhood, he started having problems, dirty looks, threats, spitting at him. He fell into depression, experiencing, experiencing obsessive disorders. None of that happened to me, I'll be honest. A month after the demonstration, he went to see his father in the maximum security prison where he was being held. He told me, if you think you betrayed me or hurt me, you're wrong. I feel for you. I'm afraid you won't be able to withstand this pressure that you're getting now. Many believed that I was repenting and collaborating with the legal system, but he wasn't. They put my picture in the newspaper next to Giuseppe Miso, a guy who killed a lot of people and ended up regretting it. So he went through some stuff and people, look, you know, my dad wasn't happy at first. We didn't speak for 10 years. Of course, everybody thought I was going to be testifying against everybody when they realized that wasn't happening. And I got violated on my parole, put back in prison. The feds were so upset with me. Well, then everybody realized that's not what he's doing. He's just really trying to make a break from the life. So my father sends for me. I hadn't seen him for 10 years. He said, I want you to meet me. I said, OK, Dad. He was on parole. I was on parole. He said, I'll meet you in such and such a place. He said, no, I won't do that. I'll meet you at your house. Quite honestly, for a moment, I didn't trust him. Because when the feds told me, you know, Persico put a contract on your life, they also said your father went along with it. Now, let me explain. Yeah, my father may have said, okay, would he have ever put a gun to my head and pulled the trigger? No, I don't believe that. But, you know, maybe somebody was following him. Who knows? The best place to meet him was at the house. So I go there. I meet him at 530 in the morning. I walk in the door. I'll never forget people. He's standing there. He looks at me, his arm crossed. He looks at me and he said, if you'd have listened to me, you'd have been the boss of the Colombo family. And I looked at him. I said, Dad, are you in like a twilight zone? Don't you realize what's happened in the past 10 years? I said, I'm out of that life. I said, I serve a different master now. And that master for me was God. So he looked at me, he said, you really serious about all this Bible stuff? I said, yeah, I am, Dad. I really am. He said, okay, let's talk. That's how we broke the ice. And then, you know, we got together again. Was it the same? No, wasn't the same, you know, because my dad was kind of guarded and I was kind of guarded when we spoke. But did we love each other? Of course. Did I support him? Of course, as best I could. People said, well, you didn't go to his funeral. No, I didn't, because I was told not to. We didn't want to make a spectacle out of it. We knew who was going there. And I'm not going to make a spectacle at my dad's funeral. I went privately after it. I visited him after, respectfully, the way I should. That's how it should have been done. So people want to criticize me. Oh, you didn't even go to his funeral. You didn't care. How dare you, you know, get involved in my personal uh, relationship with my father when you don't even know the circumstances. But you know what? That's what happens on social media. People just talk. Can't let it bother you. But it does at times. What do I have to regret, he says, only not having spoken out earlier. Uh, wow. And I like this last line. What do I have to regret? Only not having spoken out earlier. And uh, it seems that his father um, really accepted his decision to walk away. His only concern was that other people may not treat him well because of it, because he lived in Naples and Napoli. The Camorra did have a presence there, and it's a big presence in Italy. You know that. And uh, I didn't hear anything, any follow up on that. I don't know that anything happened to this young man. I'm not sure. So let's assume everything went OK. And I think his father still is in prison. You know, with my dad, um, same thing. You know, uh, people have commented, oh, Michael, you didn't even go to your dad's funeral. Well, yeah, I didn't go. Uh, only because I didn't want to make a spectacle of it. I was told who was going to be there. I was warned 
nicely not to go. And I said, you know what? I don't want to be the center of attention. Oh, all of a sudden, this guy who left the life is coming to see his dad. I went with my father several times. I visited him quite often. I tried to get him to move to California. You could see it. I have it on tape talking to him, my whole family, trying to encourage him to move out here because my wife was nice enough to say, your dad can move in with us. He didn't want to leave New York. And he couldn't stay with my sister because she... She was working all day. She couldn't care for him. He needed care around the clock. He was a hundred and some odd years old. Remember that. You know, he needed people to take him to the restroom and things like that. So that's why he was there. Oh, Michael, you let your father stay in a nursing home. He had to be there. He was a hundred plus years old, you know, and I would have taken him out here. It would have been an honor, a privilege to have him. He didn't want to come. And oh, you didn't go to his funeral. I told you why. But did I go privately? Of course. Did I visit him? Of course. You know, one of the regrets that I have with my dad um, is that as a Christian, I didn't minister to him enough. You know, I didn't, you know, I believe, uh, I'm sorry that, you know, it's an obligation. Mark 16, 15, Jesus commanded us to go and preach or share the good word with all of creation. All Christians are obligated to do that. Not impose our faith on you, not try to turn you into a Christian, not hit you over the head with the Bible, no. But we are supposed to share because we do believe the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. So that's an obligation. So I didn't do it strongly enough with my dad. It was hard. I, I can only tell you that. I'm not making excuses. It was just hard, you know, in that topic. I had people praying for my dad for over 20 years, hundreds of thousands of people. And I believe God is, is faithful, and I believe my father is in heaven. I think he repented for his sins. I do. I sent a chaplain in to see him. And she went in to see him, and she spent three hours with him. She read the Bible to him. He accepted Christ. When she walked in the door and said she was a chaplain, my father turned to her and said, oh, my son is a priest. No, I'm not a priest. But that's how he looked at it. He was proud of it. So that made me feel really good about that. So, you know, he accepted my decision. He loved my family. He wanted to see my kids, my grandchildren, uh, not suffer the same fate that my brothers and sisters and his wife, my mother, did. So he was happy for me in the end. You know, so all the stories that you hear and people that want to comment about my personal relationship with my dad, you know, why do that? You don't know us. You have no idea what went on between us or what the situation was. But people talk, social media, can't help it. That's what happens. But, uh, you know, people, I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you understand. You know, when you're being led down the wrong path, you have to be strong enough to say no. You know, I tell a lot of these gangbangers, you've got to be strong enough to say no. Now, maybe you can't say no and stay in your same neighborhood. That's why you need help. That's why whenever I go in and speak to these young kids, I make sure that there's a ministry behind me or someplace that I can send them so they can get help. Can't send them back into the neighborhood where they renounce their life and their friends are not going to take too kindly to it. It could be dangerous for them. But you have to stand up because at the end of the day, you are your own person. You. You have to be responsible for yourself. At some point in time, nobody else is going to do it. And you young men and young women that don't have the right mentor, the right father or mother figure in your house, you got to look for one. you got to seek one. Mike Tyson and I are starting a platform. Not going to get into it now because we're not ready. But both of us want to leave that legacy. We want to help. We want to give back. We want to make you be the best possible person that you can be. We want you to turn your adversity into an advantage because in this life, you only get one shot at it, people. Only one shot. You may as well do it right. If you keep doing the wrong thing, you know, and you put so much baggage on your back to carry around, remember, life is tough when everything is good. Look what we're going through now in this country. Look, inflation all time high, gasoline through the roof, kids, you know, and all this gender stuff going on, immigration out of control, all this stuff. And we're not responsible for that. Maybe some of us are for putting the wrong people in office. I had to get that in. But, you know, you got to do the right thing in life, and hopefully we'll be able to help you. But if it's not us, seek a mentor. So that's it for today. Hope you enjoyed it, my friends. Thank you so much for contributing your comments. I really appreciate it. Just keep them coming. How do I always leave you? Same way. Not going to change. Be safe. My God, I heard of a knife fight in the middle of the street in a crosswalk in Manhattan, one guy stabs another guy, kills him in front of everybody. People just walking by because what are they supposed to do? Be safe. Always be aware of your surroundings. Be healthy. 
Take care of yourself. You got to do that. We have a shot to live long in this life. You know, the advances in medicine are unbelievable. And yes, I really mean this. May God bless each and every one of you. And yes, I'll see you next time. Take care.